So thank you for coming. This is going to be an exciting program uh, in which we are going to learn about, uh, about the Bible. And the purpose of the class is, first, that we fall in love with, with Scripture. Second, that we learn how to understand Scripture. And third, the most important is that we learn how to listen to the Lord speaking to us through Scripture. As I was saying before, uh, in life, we, we yearn for the voice of the Lord. We really starve, we are thirsty of the voice of the Lord. And many times in our life, it is as if God was not talking to us. But the reality is that He is constantly speaking. The problem is that we do not know how to listen. And the reality is that many times we do not listen because we do not read the Bible. And through the Bible it is that God is talking to us all the time. I dare you, when you go to Mass, to really pay attention with your heart when we hear the readings. And I assure you that if you do that, if you really open your heart and you really pay attention, you will notice how indeed the Lord is speaking to you on every Mass, and He's telling you exactly what you need to hear. That happens. So in this class we are going to learn different aspects about Scripture that will help us to know the Lord better, that will help us to connect with God closer, and that will help us also to learn how to listen to His voice when He speaks to us. I do many things in my life. One of them is that I wrote this book that you can find in Amazon. I invite you to get this book. It's available in Amazon. It's available in print. It is available for the Kindle, a lot more cheaper. Uh, it is a meditation on the last seven words of Jesus from the cross. I also write for the Northwest Catholic. I am the editor for the Spanish section of the magazine. And uh, I write in, in, the, in the printed copy of the magazine, you will see my article every month in Spanish. But if you go to the website of the magazine, or if you download the Kindle application or the Mac application of, of the Northwest Catholic, you can also read the articles. If you go to the website and you go to Spirituality, Voices, then you will find Seeds of the World. And that's where you can find my, my writings. For example, this month, because of the Synod of Bishops, the Extraordinary Synod of Bishops in the Family starting today in the Vatican, I wrote precisely about, about family, because that's when the, the Cardinals are gathering with the Pope to discuss what to do with all these problems that we have, uh, all these realities that are putting at risk the integrity of the family all the time. So I invite you to read this article. And then, of course, you can read the rest. Uh, I also have a blog. You can visit the blog. It's seedsmagazine.wordpress.com. I write about many things. For example, this article about Jesus' ascension into heaven. Luke says it happened in Jerusalem, but Matthew says it took place in Galilee. So why the discrepancy? Who was right? Who was lying? Or what happened? Or did he ascend twice or what? So just uh, for you to take a look at that. And because we're going to study the Bible, I invite you to listen to my podcast. I started a podcast in English. Uh, I have a radio program every day, but it is in Spanish. And uh, I've been speaking in that program for seven years, almost eight. On November 2 will be my, my eighth anniversary. And uh, now I started a podcast in English for the first time. And it is on the Bible precisely. It is called A Journey Through the Bible. And, and what I am going to do is to cover every single book of the Bible. So in less than five minutes, you will learn the essentials of every book of the Bible. I have already covered the Pentateuch, so I invite you to listen to listen to or to download it in your device and play it many times. What no. station? No, it's in the internet. So you can go to soundcloud.com and look for A Journey Through the Bible in, sound, in soundcloud.com. Or if you have a podcast application in your phone, look for a journey through the Bible and you should find it. But in the end, well, I will wait, wait and I will tell you, uh, please become my friend in Facebook. This is the, the Facebook page I use for all my ministry. It's mauricio.seminans. And I, I post the podcast there, all announcements, and I will be sharing many things about this class in there as well. So please become my friend and uh, you will take advantage of what I publish there as well. But uh, 
the easiest way to connect with me probably or to see what I am up to is to visit my official website seminars.org you can listen to the podcasts right here you can get announcements about the class here uh, there is a lot of information there so <coughs> I have an online store as well if you want I, I have some CDs in English too so I invite you to visit my website and I will add a section about this particular program today it's only about concepts concepts that we will need later on but on the rest of the program, we are going to, to take, <coughs> I will tell you about each, each book of the Bible, who wrote it, at what time it was written, what was the reason for writing it, what is the main message, what are the main episodes of the book, some famous verses of it. And then, on every, on, for every book, I'm going to take a, a special text, a special passage, and we are going to make a formal interpretation of it. A formal interpretation of it. So, Aside from today, we will be studying different stories of the Bible from beginning to end. And we are going to understand how to really interpret them, to get the, the true message God is willing to communicate to us. And then we are going to make a prayer out of that text that we study. So it's going to be an experience in which you will learn the story of the Bible, you will learn the scripture itself, and you will also pray with the scripture. Because ultimately, if we do not get closer to God doing this, we are just wasting our time. All these efforts, anytime you go to any religion class, the ultimate purpose is getting closer to God. That's the, that's the true purpose. That's the true purpose. And, and that is what we want to achieve here. It is very important that we do not make this journey alone. Because if we do it by ourselves, then we are only doing it with our mind. And if we do it with our mind, chances are that we are not going to connect with God. So the only way for this to, to really be an experience of God is to invite God to come and join us on this journey. Because ultimately, it is Him who we want to listen, not me. So I invite you to close your eyes as we invite the Lord's presence among us. Lord, creator of it all, eternal source of every light, spirit of all inspiration, come, stay with us. Let us feel your presence among us. Speak to us today and we will listen. Speak to us today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the method we will use in, in the rest of the lessons, not today, but in the rest of the lessons. First, some biblical theory, which means what I told you a minute ago. Who wrote that Bible? What is the style or the genres of, of, of a given book? when it was written, what was happening in the world when it was written, because that will help us to understand why a book was written. And then we will go into the exegesis, which means the interpretation. We will select a text and then we will make a formal interpretation. And then we will go to the scriptural prayer. That is what we are going to do session after session. We have to understand some concepts in order to take uh, better advantage of, of the next sessions. Let's, let's, uh, let's begin by understanding this. Exegesis, which I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. Exegesis, that is a, a, a branch of theology. That is, it is a theological discipline that helps us to understand the biblical texts because the purpose of exegesis is to make a formal interpretation of, of the Bible. That's what it is. It is a formal interpretation of the Bible. Of course, if we're going to study the Bible, a very important concept is the Bible. It is interesting to see how many people do not know what Bible means. Right? The Bible means the books. That's what it means, because the Bible, in the end, is not a book, but rather it is a collection of books. So Bible means a collection of books. That's what it means. Uh, the word Bible comes from the Greek, Biblia, there was an expression, ta Biblia, which means the books. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a, a city in Phoenicia, now Lebanon, that was famous for, for the amount of books it published. 
it was famous for the big amount of writing, so people would go to that city in Phoenicia to learn and to read what was documented. And because of that, the Greek called that, that city Biblos, which means the city of the books. Right? So that word is all connected with the Bible. So Bible means a collection of books. The Bible, this collection of books, uh, well, had its origin in the Hebrew Bible. And they had different books, of course, in the Bible that were separated in different categories. So for them, the first books of the Bible were called the Torah, which means the law. This collection of five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are also known as Moses, because it was believed that Moses wrote all those five books, which was not the case, but that's what people believed. So they called it Moses. Then the second collection is the Nevim, which means the Book of Prophets. And this is the way the Hebrew Bible uh, uh, groups the different prophets, a little bit different from, what, from the way we do, but in the end, it is the same books, it is the same prophets. You will notice, for example, that there are some books that are split in two books, actually. The Book of Samuel is split in two, and the Book of Kings is split in two. The reason why we have two books of, of the same title is because when they were putting together all those writing into scrolls, when they ran out of paper on a scroll, they had to use another scroll, mm -hmm. and that became book number two. Yeah. That's, why, that, that's why it happened. And then, the third category was the Ketubim, which means the writings, and this is everything else for them. Books of wisdom, books of history, books of prayer, like the Psalms. In the end, it's all, it's all the books we know, plus another collection that I will mention in a moment. But this Hebrew Bible is known by the Hebrews as the Tanakh. So the Jews refer to the Bible also as the Tanakh, <coughs> not as the Bible, but as the Tanakh, or they call the Bible, rather, the Tanakh. What means Tanakh? Well, Tanakh is an acrostic formed by Torah, Nevim, and Ketuvim, which means all these three groups of, of books. You may see that Jesus in the, in the Gospel sometimes refers to Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets, right? Well, when Jesus speaks about Moses and the prophets, he is not speaking about Moses the man, and prophets, the, the men who were prophets, when every time Jesus makes a reference to Moses and the prophets, he is talking about scripture. He is talking about scripture because he is precisely talking about Moses, the Torah, and the prophets, the Nevim. This is very important because when Jesus speaks about the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets, he is speaking about the fulfillment of all scripture. When he says that, that uh, love your God with all your soul and with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself, that is what fulfills, that is what fulfills the, what Moses and the prophet said, he's speaking about the entire scripture getting condensed in that single principle of life, which is love. Now, in our Bible, in addition to these books of the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament, there is another collection of books called the Deuterocanonical books. And those are the, the books of Ezra, Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, uh, the book of Sirach, which is also known as Ecclesiasticus, uh, Baruch, and the two books of the Maccabees. Now, this is called Deuterocanonical because it means the books of the second canon. These books that I showed you first are the first canon, which means the first collection of books that were approved, the first collection of official books in the Jewish religion. But later on, there was a second canon that approved the rest of the books, these books as well. And this happened around 300 before, before the birth of Christ, there was a big, a huge community of Jews living in, in Alexandria, in Egypt. It, 
it was a numerous amount of people living there but for generations. So some people had, had been born over there in Egypt and uh, the lingua franca at the time was not Hebrew and was not Egyptian, but was rather Greek. So many people there spoke Greek in, in Alexandria, in, in Egypt, they spoke Greek. So for them to understand scripture, there was a translation made for the first time of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And that was uh, the work of 72 scholars who made the translation. And because they were 72, this new translation or this first translation of the Bible into Greek is known as the Septuaginta or the edition of the 70. In reality, they were 72, not 70, but that's the Septuaginta. And this happened around 300 years before the birth of Christ. When they made this, this translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, they added these books. All of them are written in Greek. So these books here are written in Hebrew, and these books are written in Greek. All the books of all, all these books that belong to the second canon are, are written in Greek. And this is what is called uh, known as the Alexandrian canon, right? or the Septuaginta. One common question is why Protestant Bibles remove the deuterocanonical books. And not only that, they even call them apocryphal, as if they were false, as if they were not legitimate. Well, what happened was that in the times of Jesus, this is the Bible that was used by all the Jews, including these deuterocanonical books. Even in the New Testament, we, we find references to the books of Maccabees. But around 70 to 90 after Christ, let's say 80, Christianity was, was growing rapidly, and many Jews didn't like that. They didn't want to embrace the Christian faith, and they were very jealous of their own faith. And realizing how this was the full Bible used by Christians, and them being in full disagreement with, with Christians, they gathered in a council around year 70, around year 80. And there they defined, or they, yeah, they established another canon, and in that canon they removed the deuterocanonical books. And that is known as the Jamnian canon. The Jamnian canon. So they removed them. But then, the Catholic Church in 397 in the Council of Hippo, this is the same place where St. Augustine was born, by the way, there was a council there, and in that council the Church confirmed all the books of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they confirmed them based on several things. For example, they have to be consistent with the tradition of their faith. Another thing is that they had to be consistent with the teachings of the apostles and of Jesus. And the third condition is that they had to be regularly used in liturgy. So those books that fulfilled all those three criteria were considered books of the, of the, of the Bible, inspired by God, and that's when they defined for the first time the full collection of the 72 Bibles that make up the Bible, right? So here, they confirmed the, the deuterocanonical books as legitimate books of the Bible. But then, Martin Luther, in 1534, he decided to remove them because he fought with the Catholic Church. So he removed them based on the fact that in the Janian Council, the Jews themselves had removed those deuterocanonical books, right? So that's what he said, but it was nothing but an excuse for him just to be in fight with us. But that's up to him. <coughs> then, in the New Testament we have these books. Uh, of course we have the four Gospels, we have a historic book which is the Acts of the Apostles. Then we have the letters, and the letters are grouped in three categories, or two categories, or two and a half or something. Because the thing is that we have the Pauline letters, and there is a strange letter that is the letter to the Hebrews that we will see later why, but 
Historically, it has been considered one of the Pauline letters, but we know for sure it was not written by Paul. So that's why we set it apart. But still, it is listed under the Pauline letters. And then we have another collection of letters that are called the Catholic letters. And these Catholic letters are the letter of James, the two letters of Peter, the three letters of John, and the letter of Jude. And finally, we have an, an apocalyptic book, which is the book of Revelation. Another important concept that you need to understand is the concept of a pericopy. Because in the next lessons, we are going to focus on a pericopy and make an interpretation of a pericopy. A pericopy is a piece of text in the Bible that contains a single idea. If you open your Bible, you will find books. Then, if you go into a book, you will find chapters and different sections, right? And then, inside each big section of a book, you will find small subsections that usually come with a headline in bold, right? Well, that small subsection is what we call a pericopy. And, you know, if you think of the word pericopy, it sounds like perimeter, right? Well, pericopy means that you cut around, you cut around, and then you get something. So you cut all the text around, and you get a pericopy. It is very important to understand this concept because, again, we will be working with pericopies. And they are very important to understand scripture because it is a piece of text that by itself contains a message. So to fully understand scripture, we have to focus on, on, on one pericopy at a time and, and study it in, in, a, in a formal way to really extract the message that God is conveying to us through that given book of the Bible. Now, another important concept is the concept of semiotics. The semiotics is, is uh, the art, if you will, of, of extracting a message from whatever. From body movement, from the tone of the voice, for, or from the way a text is written. So this is going to be very important to us, because as we go through the exercises of interpreting different books or, or different pericopies of the Bible, the purpose in the end is to understand the message, the real message God is willing to communicate to us. Now, to understand the Bible, you need so many resources, and it takes a lifetime to really understand the full Bible. There are some people, there are some scholars that are experts in only one pericope. There are some scholars that are experts in even one verse, and they spend a lifetime just studying and reflecting and writing about a single verse. It is very complex in the end because what we see behind the texts in the Bible is God himself, and God is infinite. So it is very hard to, to embrace it all and to understand it all, right? But still there are different uh, ways to get closer and closer to understanding the Bible. Of course, if you really want, or, or, or what scholars use to understand the Bible are the books of the Bible, in the first place, uh, the text in Hebrew. It is very important to understand the text in Hebrew, especially in the New Testament, because that is the way they were written originally. And uh, because there are some words in Greek that do not exist in another language, especially English. So when you go to the original texts, you can find the true message that was, that was communicated. We will play with this a little bit today at the end, and you will see how important it is. Then, uh, the Targumi are also important because in the times of Jesus, the liturgical language was Hebrew, but in the street people spoke Aramaic. So, there were translations of the Old Testament written in Aramaic, just for the regular people. And uh, these translations are called, the, are called the Targumi, and they are also important because that helps to understand the ideas people had at the time of Jesus about scripture. The, the closer you can get to the authentic writing, the better. Because from translation to translation and from edition to edition, then the true message begins to be distorted. Sometimes I struggle when I go to Mass. 
you know that they finally trans they finally made a, a more correct translation of the missal itself. We use the third edition of the missal, which is a lot better. It's not there yet, but it's definitely a lot better. But they also have to work on on retranslating the readings and the gospels. You know, because the translation they have is is really not that accurate. And many times I struggle when I have the missal. Because the Missa I have comes with everything in, in English and with everything in Latin. Which is, that Latin version is really close to the original in Greek of the Gospel and, and, and of all those books. And then I read and there are significant differences. Especially in the Psalms, we are not really praying what the Bible says. So that's why it is so important to go. So, so the, the closer you get to the original, the better. And that's why scholars get to, to read the codex and, the, pap and the, the, the papyrus, you know, the original, but they're actually not the original. The oldest we know are from year 70, year 80, <coughs> then there are some, some, uh, some how do you, what's the plural, the, the plural of papyrus? Some teacher who helps me, I don't know what's the plural of papyrus. Papyri or what? <laughs> whatever that is. Or papyruses, whatever that is. Uh, you know, for example, the oldest version of the of the of the Our Father in the Gospel of Luke dates from 170 or so. So it's it's even more than a century after Jesus was on earth, but still pretty close when you compare 21 centuries. What is 170 years, right? So the closest you can get to the original, the better. Then there is a translation of the Bible which is considered the most accurate translation of all of them. It is called the Biblia Stuttgartensia. And then uh, another important Bible is the New Jerusalem Bible. You're really going to study the Bible. This is the edition you need to have, the New Jerusalem Bible. That is the one used by scholars, especially when they publish their, their papers. And it is especially good because it has the best selection of cross-references. So from one verse, you can jump to another verse that is equivalent in another book of the Bible. And that helps you to navigate through scripture and to understand the concept all along scripture. Because that is also something very important. Now, something very important for us as Catholics when we understand the Bible is to definitely understand this constitution. I invite you to read it. It is an easy reading. The, the dogmatic constitution, the Iberum, in, in the Second Vatican Council. Yeah, it, it is easy in the sense that, that it is, if you read it, you will understand it. That's what I mean by easy reading, right? It's nothing that, probably there are some documents that you read and you don't understand what they talk about. This one you will understand. But the importance about this constitution is that it sets the ground for the correct interpretation of the Bible. Because that's what you want. You know, when you read the Bible, you don't want to make a mistake. Because if you make a mistake, you can, you can make a sect. Right? <laughs> that's what can happen. That's what can happen. So you want, to, you want to play safe when you are interpreting scripture. In the end, it is the <coughs> word of God that what you are trying to understand. So you should rather do it well. And one or important road has different skills. We all have different skills. Some of us write better than others. Some of us speak better than, better than others. The same thing happened with the authors of this. Even though they received the revelation from God, it was with their human hand and with their talent that they composed the different books of the Bible. And in the book of the Bible, for this reason, we will see stories, but we will also find prayers, but we will also find chronicles of history, but we will also find poems, and of course, everything has a different purpose. And you cannot read a poem as a history book, right? or you cannot read a story as a history book. So we have to consider all that when we, when we read the Bible to really try to understand again what the author wanted to communicate. So what I would like to share with you is different approaches that scholars use in the Catholic Church to, to make an interpretation of the Bible. And you will see how many things are considered to really interpret the Bible, and in the end, Nobody can claim that he has applying one method alone to understand the full text. So in the end, all these methods are complementary. 
and different scholars become masters applying one method only and then when you begin reading different approaches then you you get a better uh, level of understanding of course right? one of the keys in catholic in the catholic exegesis first of all is that the interpretation is always consistent with the teaching of the church and that is a safe guideline because when when I am interpreting something and, some, and, and then I realize that the way I am understanding something sounds very different from what, the, or from, from what the popes have been telling us for all ages, then it is more likely that I am wrong than all the popes in all ages, right? So this is the same guideline. Uh, and that's why all biblical texts have to be interpreted under the magisterium of the church. Also, one of the things of Catholic exegesis is that it doesn't have one single method that it considers as the only one. There are different methods. There are different methods. Also because the books are written in different ways. So there are some times in which a given method cannot be applied to a specific text, right? And this is very important, very, very important in the Catholic exegesis is that we recognize that the biblical texts are inspired by God, but they are the fruit of the work of a human hand. There is a human author involved in the writing of a Bible book. The different methods that we use in the Catholic Church, first of all, we have the historical critical method. It is a scientific study of the meaning of the books that were written long ago. And it is very interesting, first of all, because it studies the books from a historical point of view. And that is always very useful, especially just when we go to the uh, to the, when we study the book of Exodus, I will be applying many aspects of this method. And you will realize how fascinating it is to apply this method to understand a specific period of the people of God and to read the sacred text in light of what was historically happening at the time. Right? So it is historical and it is critical because it, it uses objective scientific criteria. And when, again, I reserve this to, to that study of the book of Exodus, but you will like it very much. The books of the Bible tend to be persuasive. They want to communicate or they want to inspire us to do something. They want to inspire us to change, to leave sin behind, to be perfect or to be saints or to live like Jesus or to be good disciples or good apostles. So because these books are inspiring, they are persuasive, one way to interpret them is to make a, a rhetorical analysis, to understand them as discourses. And especially there are many books that are written as, as a discourses. You will, will see that later on. So we considered several aspects. Who is speaking? Who is the audience? And what was the message? And then we try to understand the, how was the style in the Greco-Roman uh, rhetoric, especially when we study Paul, for example. Many times Paul speaks the way, uh, using the rules of the rhetorics of, of the Greek and the Romans, and that way we can understand better what he was trying to communicate, or, or how he he's putting, making an emphasis on, on a specific idea. But also, we have to understand the Semitic way of speaking, and of course, when we understand how we speak today, we can also apply those, those rules to the, to the books of the Bible and try to understand how they resound nowadays. Many other books of the Bible are stories. They are written in narrations. So when we, when we read the book of the Bible, it's interesting to see the story behind it. Who is telling the story? And who is the recipient of that story? And then we can make a distinction, for example, between the real author of a book and the implied author of a book, right? Like the case of Moses, remember? Moses was not the real author. I will speak about the authors of, of the Pentateuch next time. Moses was not the real author, but anyway, they give, they give full authority to the five books of the Pentateuch by claiming that Moses was the author, right? That gives them full authority because Moses was regarded as the best, as the best of the prophets as the liberator. So when we claim these books were written by Moses, we're giving full authority to them. But also, there is the opposite. The real reader versus the implied reader. 
For example, in the book of Luke and the book of the, in the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, we see that Luke writes those books to a person he names Theophilus, right? Well, Theophilus means beloved by God. So, the, the implied reader, the real reader, in the end, is that Luke writes these books to a specific man, but in the end, he is writing to an entire community of Christians that came from the Gentile world. Right? <coughs> then the semiotic analysis, again, remember that the purpose of semiotics is to determine the message, the message. And we are going to apply this a lot for one single reason. This is my favorite method. Oh. And that's the one I have used the most, so I have more practice using it. And uh, we will follow three principles. First of all, the, the principle of immanence, which means each, each text forms a, uni a, a, unit of, a unit of meaning complete on itself, the pericopies. A pericope has a message by itself. We are going to study that pericope. Then, the structure. Each passage we interpret follows a given structure, and that is very important to understand the meaning. You will see later why. And also it follows some grammar rules, and that leads to the structure. And by understanding the structure based on the rules, then we will be able to draw the main message. Okay. This is also very important. The book is a collection of books, but in the end, all the books of the Bible contain the revelation of God. So. If we are going to read a book of the Bible, we have to read it using the entire Bible as the context. We cannot isolate a piece of text from the Bible. Every part of the Bible has to be understood in light of the full scripture. And that way we can see when we go to Mass how the first reading is always connected to the Gospel. They speak about the same always. The first reading and the Gospel speak about the same. Right? And that way we can see the connection and we can see how we cannot isolate one from the other in the end.